Hey, welcome to the garage. Hey, I'm gonna start off by just uh, praying real quick, so that way your hearts and my hearts can be stewarded to what the Lord has to say. I don't have any candy. All right, Jesus, thank you so much um, that we're all able to make it here tonight, God. I pray that, yeah, you just, I pray that your presence is here, God, and I pray that you speak through me um, and that you also just open up my eyes and ears as well as your students and whoever's in, these, whoever's in this room. Um, just open up our hearts um, to take in your presence, to take in your words and your truths of who you are and what you tell us. Speak through me, please, Jesus. We love you, um, but not as much as you love us. Amen. Okay, cool. So, obviously, we just uh, sung that little old church song, Jesus Loves You, if you didn't know it. And so, basically, what I wanted to kind of talk about today is this saying, Jesus loves you, right? Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot over this week because as I was preparing this message, um, obviously we're doing a series called From the Heart, where everyone each week just shares what's been on their heart. And on my heart was like, just Jesus, like who Jesus is, what, what that means. And so I was going to tell you, like, my original message was, hey, let's talk about what, or sorry, well, what to, yeah, what and who Jesus is. And I was going to share all about that. And then um, I had a really cool experience last night on a plane as I was flying back from Texas, and it kind of changed my message because it really just spoke to me. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, I just got back from Texas at like 2 a.m. last night. It was a really great time. I was visiting a friend, and and I just felt like I kept hearing the word love come up, and it's not for the reason some of you may think it is. Um, It's just because, no, no, no. It's because I was asking a lot of my friends that I met up with, hey, how's your relationship with Jesus? How are you doing? And I felt like I was just getting reminded of his love, right? I just kept hearing that, and I felt like he was bringing that up to me. And so anyways, I was on the plane last night, flying home. I was really excited to read my book for like two minutes and then fall asleep, right? I don't know. That's what I do on a plane. And so I was doing that. I, was, I put in my little playlist, queued up some Brandon Lake, and then I was going to Um, read the book. But before that, before the plane took off, you know how you kind of have a little bit of service if you don't go on airplane mode? I never go on airplane mode. It's probably bad for me. Um, So you have a little bit of service as the plane is like leaving. And so I was Snapchatting a friend one last time. And I Snapchatted her and I looked and the lady sitting next to me was in the Snapchat and I busted out laughing. Like it was hilarious. I actually have the photo if you don't mind putting that up. Yeah, you see, this is the lady that was sitting next to me. I did not know her. I didn't talk to her or anything before. I was just, like, Snapchatting. And then I see her face come in, and I busted out laughing. Um, and I just thought it was so funny. So she asked me, like, hey, who's that Snapchat going to? And I told her the story. And she was really, like, encouraging and affirming to me and, and everything I had told her. And um, she asked me what I do. And I said, hey, I, I serve... Um, on staff at a church, because I used to be really, not embarrassed, but like, I was like shy of saying that, Um, and I realized, hey, how important and bold and faithful it is to share that, hey, you walk with Jesus, and you love God, and you want people to know that, so I shared that with her faithfully, and thank God I did, Um, because we had a really long conversation about it, and then you, you can take her off, her name, her name is Nisa, she was like, yeah, like Nissan, I was like, that doesn't make sense, but sure, Nisa. Um, I told her I was in grad school to be like a mental health counselor, and then she went on a whole other tangent about that, and she was like, oh, no way, like, I really love that. My oldest daughter is a licensed counselor, and then we started talking about that a little bit. I told her my heart for that, and she said, can I ask you something? And I said, yeah, sure, and she said, my youngest daughters, who are 17 and 19, I think, she said, they are both facing some form of depression and anxiety in so many ways than her older kids. She had like three older kids in, in their like 20s and 30s. And she was like, my older kids never face this. And she's like, why do you think that is? And I wanted to be like nice and like politically correct or whatever. And I was just like, oh, well, you know, they're surrounded by things that are pulling them in each and every direction. They got social media, instant gratification, 
They got people telling them what to do and how to do it. Um, comparison and not being enough and, and all these things. And so I said, yeah, I think I definitely see that a lot in, in y'all's age group. And she thought that was true. And then she replied and said, she's like, oh, yeah, I get that. She's like, I'm not really sure. Like, I don't force my kids to go to church or youth group, which I agree with. I was like, cool, yeah. And she was like, but her answer really surprised me. She said, I think it's because they don't know that Jesus loves them, one. And two, they don't really know what that means. And I was like, facts, Nisa, because I feel like, and maybe not y'all, but maybe also y'all, especially like in Parker, um, but I grew up in like South Texas, and everything I knew about Jesus or God um, was what some people would label like systematic theology, and that's more of like a philosophical, like kind of religious way of like saying like God is omnipotent and omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscious, all of these things, right? We don't see, does some of y'all know what that? Anyways, it's like while all those things are true, and I believe in them, I think there's so much more, there's much more of a simple way for Christians to tell about the God who saved you, right? Especially to others. Um, and like I said, all those things are true. But the crazy thing is, like, Jesus doesn't start his ministry by telling everyone, I am omni this, omni that, omni that, I am that. Like, he actually starts off just like you and me, right? He starts off as a baby and works his way up in ministry until, or not works his way up, but lives his life. And I'll get a little bit more into that. I just think, like, instead of telling people all these crazy things about God or what he is, you really can just be like, he's just like you and me, and he loves me. And I know that saying, Jesus loves me, is like, I feel like it's pretty stereotypical or something. But there's a lot of truth and a lot of depth behind that. Um, and so I kind of, my first point, wanted to get into why Jesus loves you. And it's really simple, and that will take me to my first slide. Um, Jesus loves you because he created you. There's over like a hundred or so verses in the Bible that talk about God creating you, right? Um, I have a couple of verses on the next slide. If you guys want to take a picture of them, I didn't, I didn't put the, uh, the scripture because I'll, I'll read it. Um, in Genesis 1.27, we read, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's so many Bible verses about God knitting you and forming you and creating you in your mother's womb. It says you are beautifully and wonderfully created. And so I think my first point, I said, well, obviously that's a really good reason of why Jesus loves you. It's because he created you. And I know that can maybe be like a little hard for some of us that don't have a good relationship with our mom or our dad. And, and hey, I get that. Um, but I feel like when our moms gave birth to us, I think everyone in here came from a mom, um, their intention was to have a relationship with you, right? Their intention was to love you. And I think that while that is also true that you should have a relationship with your mom who formed you in her womb or Okay, yeah, you were formed in her womb. A uh, whole other sermon topic. We'll get into that at a different time. Um, I think the importance of that is, hey, we should love and value not only the one that birds us, but the one that created our mom, right? The one that created our dad. And so, like I said, I know not all of us have this perfect relationship, um, but the importance of being created by God. He calls you beloved son or healed daughter, children, brother, sister, friend, all of these titles and labels are in the Bible. But if you think about it, all those titles like brother, sister, father, they require a relationship or at least some knowledge of relationship so that way you can feel their love, right? requires sacrifice and quality time and intentionality, talking, spending time with someone. When I think about like, well, why does God love us? It makes so much sense that he created us to be in relationship with him. 
That's my first point, and I hope you guys get to read a couple of those Bible verses. When I put the Bible verses up there, you can just leave them on until my next um, point, in case anyone misses it. But my next one of, hey, why does Jesus love you, is because he is just like you. If you've read much of the Bible, there's a section called the New Testament, and the first books of the New Testament are called the Gospels, and it basically just means the life of Jesus. Not only that, like the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And um, they're all kind of different. But there's this one uh, gospel titled Luke. And it kind of goes into Jesus' like childhood or how he was as a, as a kid a little bit. Um, and it's just like you and I, right? Jesus came into this world as a baby. He was a child. He grew up. And then... You know what? Yeah, I should probably explain that. Jesus and God. You guys know, like, they're the same person? The Holy Trinity? Red nose. It's like Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And God created us to be in relationship with him, but obviously, like, sin or wrongdoings or whatever people are allowed to call it nowadays, um, that marred our relationship with God. So God, loving us and creating us, came in to the world just like you and me, so that way you can have some like credib- credibility to him. And that's why my point is because he is just like you. He felt all of the things we felt. He was overwhelmed, he had sorrow, he had grief, he had love. Even at times he was a little bit frustrated. Uh, Jesus liked to eat food, he loved to be with friends, talk to strangers, spend time with people. And he also sympathizes with our weakness, which is one of my favorite Bible verses. And I just think, like, how dope is that? That a God that loved us and created us wanted to come down and be just like us. So that way we can know him and have a relationship with him. Jesus was also tempted. I don't know if you guys have read that story in the Bible. And that makes him even more like us, the fact that he was tempted. But the one thing that sets that apart is unlike us, he never sinned. He was tempted, though he never sinned. And that's what separates us from you and from Jesus. And that's what separates his love from us. That's why he's like a perfect God. Because we can never be like that. I know, I mean, some people might tell you you're perfect, and you probably are perfect. Pretty good, pretty close. I know God sees you. That's perfectly and wonderfully and beautifully made. But he loves you so much to, what's that saying? Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus accepts you. But he loves you too much to leave you like that. Um, Here's some other, here's a couple of verses I have for this section. Uh, just the next slide. Yeah. Jesus. There's a lot of different parts of the Bible that speak of who Jesus is. The book of John, actually, it's, it's another gospel, um, basically another story of the life of Jesus. And they're all pretty different. And I think that's really cool because I feel like if God came down on earth as man, and died for our sins, and then resurrected, people wouldn't believe that if it was just one person telling a story, Right? When you guys have beef or drama or whatever, it's usually one-sided. And whoever hears that is only from one side of the story. And that could be really hard to believe. But if there's four people there, if there's four witnesses telling the story, it has a lot more credibility to it. And the book of John speaks of who Jesus is. He says, I am the life, I'm the truth, I'm the way, I'm the water, I'm the bread, I'm so many things. But the one important thing, or one of the ones that I want to point out, is he says, I and the Father are one. And I love that verse because I've been calling God the Father lately. It just kind of feels more personal to me. Hey, this is what the Father taught me today. This is what the Father showed me. This is how I feel. This is how I accept his love. In Philippians 2, talks about Jesus being like us again. It says, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Some translations say taking the form of a slave and being in the likeness of men. Being just like us, even though he's so powerful in all those things I listed a little while ago, he came down on earth just like you and me. 
to live life with you and me, to die for you and me. And it really all just makes sense. And like I just said, Jesus came down to live life with you and me. Takes me to my next point. Jesus loves you because he is with you. Not only do we see it all throughout the Bible, Jesus being with people and hanging out with people and eating and drinking and living and dancing and laughing and all these awesome, amazing things. He's actually with people. He probably got, well, he probably didn't, but I get bored and tired of people sometimes. Imagine someone who never does that. That's Jesus. All right, guys, if y'all listen up real quick, I'm going to read this story from the Bible. Um, It's a story from the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories. It's from the book of Daniel. Um, And a little bit of intro to this. There's this king of Babylon. You guys heard of the the Babylon place? So there's this great, powerful, evil king. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. And when I was a kid, I used to always get that confused with the, the Christmas guy. What's his name? Ebenezer Scrooge, which Ebenezer is also in the Bible. I don't know why I got those confused, but I thought that was him. So I was always scared of him. Um, I didn't put the full story up on there, but you can go to the next slide. If you want to take a picture and read this, it's one of the most powerful stories. I think it means so much to me because it was one I heard when I wasn't even walking with God. Right? We can know so much about God and not know God at all. I'll say that again. We can know about God and not actually know God at all. Well, I'm going to read that story. It's Daniel 3, 16 to um, 28. And so Nebuchadnezzar is there, and he's, he builds this really big gold statue, and he's telling everybody to worship him and to bow down to him. And I'll, I'll, this is a SparkNote version. Um, but there's three teenage guys. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were probably like some of y'all's age, maybe older, maybe younger. I don't really know. Um, And he threatened them because they didn't bow down to him. And he said, if you don't bow down to me and worship me and worship my statue, I'll burn you in a furnace. And they refused to bow down. So he got even more mad. But they didn't want to do it. And so this is from the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us. He will deliver us from the blazing furnace and from your hand. But even if he does not, he is still good. And I could end there and talk about a whole other different sermon or message, um, but that's not what I'm talking about today. So he says, we want you to know, or the the three teenagers say, we want you to know that we would not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered that the furnace be heated up seven more times than it usually is, so seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of his strongest shoulders, shoulders, strongest soldiers in his army to tie them up and to throw them in the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes and trousers, trousers, yeah, I didn't know I was going to read that. Trousers and all their other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing fire. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed those strong shoulders that took them into the fire. Isn't that crazy? And so they fell into into the blazing furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped up to his feet in amazement and asked his servants, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in that fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Fill in your names. He shouted to y'all and said, come out of that fire. He probably said it a lot more harsh than that. And he saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies one bit. Not even one hair, one piece of clothing was singed on them. They couldn't even smell the fire. 
the fire that killed the people that put the three guys in that furnace. They couldn't smell it on these three teenage guys. And so King Nebuchadnezzar praised them. And he said, praise the God that you serve. Praise the God who was with you in the fire. I think that's always been really significant to me because when I find myself in the middle of the chaos or confusion or pain or hurt or just the ebbs and flows of lives, lives, life, the only person I can go to is God, right? Even it's, when it's really hard because no other person can really go deep down and pierce my heart into that fire like God can. And his love is the only thing that cannot be burned away. So many things that we cherish or hold close or, or worship, like our phones, our friends, like our status, all of that can be burned away. None of that's going with you when you die. But the one that cannot be burned is Jesus. Because he is not only with us at all times, but he is for us at all times especially when our world comes crashing down, especially when we are in the midst of the fire. He is always with us. Remember that story when you are in a hard time. There is always another in the fire. And my next point is Jesus loves you because he forgives you. You guys hear it all the time. You guys hear that too. Jesus forgives you. Jesus loves you. Um, I was... Nope, not going to talk about that story. Cool. So I have a couple more Bible verses to put up here. And they talk about Jesus' forgiveness is of you. Micah 7.9 says, He will again have, again, key word, again, always and always and always have companion, companion, compassion on us. He will stomp on our sins with his feet and he will cast them into the depths of the sea. That's what he does with your sins, right? That's what he does again and again and again. He forgives you. Hebrews 8 says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. God doesn't take count of your sins. He doesn't keep track of them. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful and just, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all of our wrongdoings. I know that sounds like super unrealistic or religiously, and if you don't believe that, uh, I'm sorry, and, I'll, and I really will pray that you will believe that, that God does forgive you, and that God does love you, even though it sounds like such religious jargon, or if it just sounds unrealistic. But it's true, and I think it's true, because imagine if all of our other relationships, or, or friendships, or family members, or people that hurt us, Imagine if they always forgave us and kept no wrong. Imagine if they didn't remember all the wrong things that we did to them or how much they hurt us. I think that's exactly what Jesus does because he, because he loves you. And I think there's a group of you in here, maybe some that aren't even listening, and that's fine. It says, or some of us in here that say like, hey, I, I don't believe that someone can forgive me because I've been hurt by so many people and I've been let down by so many people in the past or today or yesterday. I get that. I think the difference is none of those people are God. None of them are God in human form. But some of you treat them like they are. Instead, our God loves us. Our God is a king. He's the beginning. He's the end. That's why he loves us. Because he is the only person that can actually forgive us and never get tired of it. I think a lot of us get too caught up on like, hey, the things I've done or the past or just all my mistakes. Um, another thing, I think, hey, God already knows all those things. Jesus knows your past. He knows your future, he knows your present, and he still offers you love and forgiveness in life through all of those things. I like this example as well. It's in um, the book of Luke again. It's when Jesus is dying on the cross for us, people that don't even, uh, 
know that or like take advantage of that or think about that. Like imagine you dying for someone. Imagine you putting your life down for someone. Can you do that? I don't think I can right now. And so Jesus is dying on the cross, and one of the men crucified next to him. Did you guys know there was two other people being crucified with Jesus on the cross? Well, one of them is being put to death, and uh, he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, saying, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's Luke 23, 42. Despite this criminal's sin, because they were criminals that probably did something outrageous or insane in order to be hung on a cross. And Jesus accepted them. It was super simple. He said, I'll remember you. You'll be with me in paradise. He not only forgave them, but he promised them eternity in heaven. I think the really cool thing about that is that man probably gave his life to Jesus right, after, right before he died. And so God's not saying, okay, you confessed that you believe in me, now you have to live this completely perfect life. Or now, hey, like you're kind of a little too late. You're about to die, so you can't really be in a relationship with me or accept my love. And that's not true, because we see it there in the Bible. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Because he forgives us, and he sustains us, and he has a plan for us. For us. And it, don't, it doesn't only mean that he loves us or that he heals us, but he also protects us and knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for our lives because he calls us to that. He, he calls us to live life fully and, and abundantly. I think those of you in here who know what's best for you, including myself, I tell myself this all the time. I'm like human, totally imperfect, make mistakes all the time. And that's the crazy thing about a God who loves you is he doesn't care and he forgives you again and again and again. He wants us to be healed and comforted. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to be joyful and to feel loved. You guys know like a bunch of people that want you to feel those things always, even after you mess up, even after you do them wrong? I don't. And I think the thing about that love is that it can't be separated. Like nothing can separate you from that love. People will probably tell you that or try to make you question or doubt your faith. Um, but Jesus says, hey, I know you. You follow me. I give you eternal life. And you will never perish. No one can snatch you out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to take that away. I think uh, I have some more verses after that. that. That verse is in it. And then Romans 8. It's one of the great Bible verses. If you ever think that God doesn't love you or you don't feel God, it's a, pro it's a proclamation. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities, things present, things to come, no power, no height, no death or depth, Nothing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And my question is like, why? Why does he forgive us so much? Why does he love us so much? Why do these adults or young adults at garage always kind of tell me that all the time? Even though you kind of need to be reminded of that every week. I need to be reminded of it every morning. Um, it's really simple. It's, he loves us because he wants us to be in a relationship with us with him. He wants us to be in relationship with him. All of the sin or the unforgiveness or, or pettiness that ruins your other people's relationships, right? Like your relationships with your friends or someone you know, someone in this room. He loves us and he wants us back, right? I think one of my favorite songs, it's kind of past now because I overplayed it, but it's called Jaira, and, and it says, if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, um, and he watches over the sparrows, how much more does he love you? And I used to sing that every single day, just to remind me of his love. And he doesn't love us just because 
He must do it. He loves us because that's who he is. That's the truth of who he is. That's the joyful, eternal truth that God is love. And it has very little to do with what you do or what you say or or what happens in your life, but everything to do with him because that's who he is. The band can start coming up, and I'm going to read another story or just tell you another story about Jesus, right? Because that's what this is all about. This is all about Jesus and why he loves you or why you hear that so much. Um, When he was leaving his disciples, he tells them to go and share about his love for them and others. And even though I know that's like really scary, really intimidating, I think about that all the time. If I don't share God's love for other people, how are they gonna know? If I wasn't bold on that plane and told that woman I uh, told Nisa that I was, that I worked at a church, we would have never had that conversation. And the flight from Texas to Denver is like two hours and 15 minutes. Well, by the time you know it, we, the lights came on and I was like, oh, why, why are the lights on? And she's like, oh, we're in Denver. And I was like, we've, we've been talking for like 10 minutes and, and really we're talking for two hours and 15 minutes. And it's because the whole time we were just talking about God's love. God loves us because that's his character. That's who he is, like I said. And if God is love, then I can't say he loves me because of what's in me. God loves me because what's in him. And he wants us to accept that love. Not earn it. We don't have to do all these things. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to talk about it as far as like, oh, I can't do this today because I need to earn God's love. We just got to simply accept it. Uh, and I have one question up here that I want you to think about before um, we get into to worship. And if you want to take a picture of it, you might want to reflect on it later, because I did for a really long time. It says, what are you believing that is opposite of Jesus' love for you right now in your life? What are you believing that is opposite of his love for you, of everything I just said, of everything you'll read in those Bible verses? But during worship, I don't only want you to think about that question or the answers or the multiple never-ending answers of why you think that. Um, But I want you to speak to it, right? I want you to speak to that lie, make it known, bring it up, and then make it bow down to Jesus. Everything that is contrary to his love for you, tell it to bow down at the feet of Jesus and be gone. I promise you it is that simple. Tell that lie that you have a compassionate, loving, relational, friendly, faithful God who loves you. A God who is slow to anger. A God who is forgiving and loving of all of our sins sins and all of our wrongdoings. I challenge you to do that today. If you're here with someone, um, hey, just get some space to just worship God and be with God. Get off your phones, please, while you are worshiping and just spend it with God and speak those lies. It's not only for God, it's for you. You know how many lies we tell ourselves each and every day? The whole reason I got into this little sermon, the whole reason why it's on my heart, because this random lady asked me, why do my teenagers feel so unloved? Why do they feel so depressed? Why is there so much mental health going on? And it's not because of anything you did. Right? None of that's bad. Obviously, I'm, I'm trying to be a counselor and, and help love and serve people like that. Um, but it's about these lies. It's about these lies that we believe in. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get into worship and then get going. Um, God, I thank you for your son. God, I thank you for coming down on this earth to be with us, to love us, to accept us, to heal us. I pray for these students that they wouldn't be scared of the fire or scared of the water or anything in their lives. I pray that they know that you're with them always. You love them. You're the overcomer. You are great. You are a king, and you're always with us. And I pray for each and every student in this room to come alive in your name, Jesus. I pray 
May you remind them of your love from them each and every time. And not only that, but you want us to love ourselves and you want us to love others and you want us to serve others. God, if you tend to the lilies and the sparrows, if you're in the fires and in the water, how much more do you care about us? How much more do you love us? God, I've seen too much and I've heard too much of your love, and I pray that these students are reminded of that. I pray that we won't keep quiet about your love. Amen. As we move into this next song, I just want you to listen to the words and speak them over the lies that we tell ourselves. Um, God loves us more than we can ever imagine. Um, just join me in this song.
God, thank you for the opportunity we had to be here tonight um, and to gather and to know you as a community. I pray that going into this next school year, you 
um, speak the truth of your love into our lives um, and mute the lies that we hear. Um, show us your love so we can show it to others. Amen. Amen. Give it up. Give it up. Oh, thank you. All right, guys. Two things we say every week. Oh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Woo. All right. Two things we say every week. You are loved and prayed for, and you are accepted here just the way you are. We're going to go to our little small groups for a minute if you've got some time. And Sophie said we're doing after hours at Slim Chickens after that if you want to go. But go find your small group. Yeah, according to Sophie. You just leave them. Go in peace and serve the Lord.